Now I'd like to introduce a type of electrical component known as a capacitor because it has a capacity for storing electric charge. Conceptually, we can think of a capacitor as being made of two parallel conducting plates that are separated by some space. You put a potential difference across the two plates. In other words, the two plates have a different electrical potential. When that happens, the charges will move in response to that potential. Um, you'll have positive charges moving in the direction of the potential, negative charges moving opposite the direction. And when they do that, there's going to be a tendency for them to come back because the opposite charges attract. So the charges will migrate in response to the potential until they set up a potential of their own that exactly cancels that, in which case that's when they'll stop. So the amount of charge stored we can call Q, which is going to be uh, proportional to the voltage, because the higher the voltage across the plates, the more charge that you can store. So the C is the capacitance of the capacitor. Capacitance is going to be a property of a particular capacitor. The unit of capacitance is what it has to be. It has to be a coulomb per volt because you multiply a voltage by it to get a charge. So it's a coulomb per volt. That's known as the farad, whose symbol is capital F. So capacitance is the amount of charge separation per volt. A large capacitance means that you can separate a lot of charge on the plates, the capacitors, without requiring a whole lot of voltage. That kind of means I think of that as being a squishy capacitor that a little bit of voltage pushes a lot of charge uh, separation onto the plates. The ferret itself is a very large unit of capacitance. Most capacitors are much smaller than that. Um, typically, capacitors that you find in a circuits are going to be picofarads or nanofarads. Occasionally, you can get some big capacitors that are in the microfarad range or hundreds of microfarads range maybe even thousands of microfarads. There are some modern capacitors, such as one that I demonstrated in class, that actually have capacitances in the order of one farad, but typically you can only have a small voltage stored across them, so you really can't store a whole lot of, uh, you can't really store a whole lot of energy in that. And we'll talk about the energy of a capacitor in a moment. Let's think first about what goes on when you have a capacitor in a circuit. So we have here a voltage source that's however it's done. Um, it puts a voltage across the two different plates, you know, one positive side and one negative side. If we have a capacitor in series with this voltage source, well, the voltage source will push a positive charge onto one of the plates and a negative charge onto the other plates, and you have a charge separation. So however much negative charge is taken off of one plate is put onto the next plate because the uh, charges have to go somewhere. We're not creating or destroying any charges. When we do that, we've charged the capacitor to some potential delta V. And then the charge on the capacitor, the separated charge, is going to be C times delta V, where, again, C. If we then take out the voltage source, the capacitor itself is a voltage source. And so between the poles of the capacitor are some potential. One will be positive, one will be negative with respect to the other. So you can think of a capacitor as storing electrical energy in the field. What I mean by the field is there is an electric field between the two poles of the capacitor, between the two plates. Uh, one side has positive charge, one side has negative charge. The positive side is going to have the higher potential. The negative side is going to have the lower potential. So that's what we're talking about, is the potential energy of the separated charges. Or we can think of this as the amount of energy it takes to move the charge from one plate to the other. So how does a capacitor work? To understand how a capacitor works, it's best to think of a theoretical ideal construct that can't exist in real life, which is an infinite conducting plate, which has some electric charge on it. We're going to say that the charge density is uniform. In other words, the amount of charge per area is going to be constant everywhere on this plate. So we're looking at this plate uh, edge on. This plate is going infinitely out of the screen and infinitely up and down. When we do this, if this is positively charged, then it's going to be surrounded by uniform electric fields on both sides of the plate, and the electric field points away from the plate. So it's perpendicular to the plate, pointing away in all positions. We can justify this by symmetry considerations. 
uh, because if you have a positive charge here or here, anywhere around the plate, it's going to be receiving repulsions from everything on the plate. And if this plate is truly infinite, all of the vertical components are going to cancel. Uh, repulsion from somewhere below is going to be met, met by an equal repulsion from somewhere above, the same distance above. And since the plate is infinite, these are all going to cancel out. And the only thing that you have left are the horizontal components. So this will give us an infinite uniform electric field. In reality, of course, an infinite plane of charge can't exist. But for all practical purposes, if we have a finite plane of charge, if we're looking at some place near it, a position near this plane of charge, then it's effectively infinite in that influences from far away are very small. So near a finite plane of charge, the field is still going to be uniform and the finite plate is going to essentially act like it's an infinite plate. So this isn't a really bad way of approaching this. Theoretically, the electric field, the strength of this uniform field, has this very simple value, 1 half sigma over epsilon naught. Sigma, recall, is the charge density that we've got on this plate of charge. Epsilon naught is one of those fundamental constants of the universe. This one's called the permittivity of a vacuum, or the permittivity of free space. And it's got the value of 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 coulomb squared per newton meter squared. So what about an actual capacitor? We looked at an infinite plane of charge. So now we'll look at an infinite parallel plate capacitor, which consists of two infinite planes, which are parallel to each other. And each has an opposite electric charge, which is uniformly distributed on each plate. So individually, the negative plate is going to have a uniform electric field pointing inward, uh, with hatch, which has a magnitude of 1 half sigma over epsilon naught. The positive plate is going to have a uniform electric field directed outward with a magnitude of 1 half sigma over epsilon naught. If we put these two together, parallel to each other, well, in between the two plates, there's going to be a contribution from the field of the negative plate and a contribution of the field from the positive plate. These are going to be in the same direction. It's going to be pointing away from the positive plate and toward the negative plate. And since these two fields are in the same place, they're going to combine, and the total magnitude of the field is just going to be sigma over epsilon naught. Outside the capacitor, on the outside of the plate, the negative plate would have a field directed to the left. The positive plate would have an equal field directed to the right. So on the right side, the fields cancel. You can use exactly the same reasoning to see that on the left side of the plate, the fields are going to cancel as well. So all the field is in between the plates. Therefore, all the energy is between the plates of the capacitor. For a finite plate capacitor, still, between the plates, you're going to have pretty much a uniform electric field. Maybe at the edges, things will be a little bit different. You'll have a fringe field there. But for the most part, between the plates is where all the field is going to be. That's where all the action is. So the fields cancel outside, maybe a little bit of fringing uh, at the edges of the field. But inside, you'll have this uniform field. And so we can pretty much treat a finite parallel plate capacitor as if it's an infinite parallel plate capacitor, as long as the separation between the plates is very small compared to the plate sizes themselves.